the Working Preacher Books podcast, a series focused on igniting your curiosity as a preacher and connecting you with the living word. Join me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson, along with Bandit the Podcast. As we gain insights and hear stories straight from Working Preacher authors about proclaiming an authentic word in challenging times. In this episode, the first episode of this new series, we will talk with Walter Brueggemann, author of Preaching Jeremiah and Preaching from the Old Testament in the Working Preacher books. Walter, we are so glad to have you here with us and welcome to this brand new Hot Off the Presses Working Preacher Books podcast. Thank you. I'm uh, so glad to get to be with you and to talk about one of my favorite subjects. But we should mention also that uh, you are the author of a few other books besides the two in the Working Preacher book series. (laughs) Probably our listeners know that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Good. (laughs) Well, so um, preaching today, how is it the same and how is it different, you think, from Jeremiah's context? Well, I think uh, we would imagine uh, that it is quite different because of uh, the long history of that's changed our uh, cultural perception of things. So it's easy to talk about how different it is. And what I'm interested in is how closely paralleled it is uh, because ours, like the time of Jeremiah, uh, is a time of violence. It's a time of loss. It's a time of bewilderment. It's a time of fear. Uh, and I think uh, that the book of Jeremiah gives voice to all of that. And before it finishes, it also manages to give voice to hope. And uh, that is a, a much needed voice in our time that is not easy to sound. So I think uh, the themes of loss and hope are very closely uh, uh, aligned from Jeremiah's time to our time. Yeah, it sounds a lot like law and gospel, doesn't it? Well, it <laughs> might if I were a Lutheran, yes. <laughs> so um, on page eight, you, you say that um, biblical proclamation is something we ourselves would rather not undertake because such voicing is deeply demanding and risk-laden, not only a risk uh, of professional career, but risk of a deeply personal kind you know it's a risk you know you say courageous imaginative countercultural thoughts unpack that a little bit well i think it's a a, a risk uh, because uh, the preacher is so uh, exposed and so out there uh, insisting on a, a line of thinking and seeing and trusting uh, that is so alien to our culture And indeed, it is alien to the culture that the preacher occupies. Uh, So I think it takes uh, enormous uh, intentionality to stay at that and to keep insisting that this way of perceiving the world is a legitimate way to perceive the world when there are so many voices telling us otherwise and contradicting that. You have, you have in there one word that I find particularly compelling and in uh, continuity with your uh, long career, and that is imaginative. That prophetic preaching is imaginative, and it takes me back to your, uh, what you once said to me was, you said probably your most influential book, um, The Prophetic Imagination. And so just talk about what, it, what is imaginative? What, what is imagination from a Christian sense? I take it to be the capacity to host a world that is other than the one that is in front of us. The one in front of us is uh, scientific, uh, conditioned by enlightenment, rationality, and all of that. And uh, what what our gospel imagination insists upon is that that's not Uh, That's not a faithful way to perceive the world. A faithful way to perceive the world is through promise and covenant and all those ingredients of of gospel faith. Uh, So it requires 
great will and great intentionality and great resolve uh, to continue to dwell in and bear witness to a world that contradicts the world that almost all of us take for granted. Uh, and it invites the congregation uh, into a zone of perception uh, that contradicts the rest of our life. I think that's such an important reminder right now, Walter. I remember reading uh, that book in, in seminary. It was a required textbook for our preaching class and, and being drawn into that calling and that vocation of of presenting a world that is, uh, that's, that's God's world. And I, I particularly think about that right now when, when our world has changed so much <laughs> or, or maybe, or what our world really is like has been exposed, perhaps we wanna say. And, uh, and what a promising word that is going to be for our listeners to, uh, as you said in the book about imaginative, uh, that uh, that it's done playfully and openly uh, in our culture, and that it's so that God's God will be proclaimed in such a way that it is good news. Yeah. Uh, and so I just was really struck by that, particularly yeah. now. And and if and if and if preachers are holding on to different uh, meanings and purposes of preaching maybe this is something to hold on to right now. Do you think that that's, do you think that's true? I do. What I, what I hear most from preachers who do not sustain that imagination is that they take biblical texts and they fit them into the world uh, that we already take for granted. Mm -hmm. So it's not faithful. It's not really an act of imagination. It's an act of accommodation. And I think it, it takes a great intentionality to be doing the other work rather than accommodating the biblical text uh, to the world at hand. You can't do that if you're only talking to people that agree with you already. That's correct. That's right. That's more fun. <laughs> it's not, it, it's safer. Not really, but it's safer. It's safer. How about that? Yeah. But right. it's so, therefore, it's less dangerous. I mean, I mean, in, in the sense that to talk to, we all will accommodate proof texts to yes. our existing worldview, won't we? Right, right. But it is it is a it is a continuing act of negotiation, and therefore it is not simply reiteration that we are always having to find fresh forms of articulation that take into account uh, the present combatants. <laughs> in the interpretive act. And the present combatants in the interpretive act require us to find freshness and not simply reiteration. You know, one of the things that I, I was in related to that, that I was really struck by in this, uh, in this reading your book, Walter, uh, and you have a postscript about this, that you finished this manuscript prior to the pandemic. Yes. And and naming uh, in Jeremiah of this defining trauma of the loss of the famili of familiar Jerusalem and wow uh, the way in which then Jeremiah can speak into the trauma of the loss of the familiar church right right uh, yeah. that was really we're going to need Jeremiah right now that's right. <laughs> My, uh, my colleague, Kathleen, Kathleen O'Connor, has a book on Jeremiah that she interprets through trauma theory. It, it's an argument that, that uh, Jeremiah is really processing that trauma. And indeed, that's what preachers are doing today is uh, processing the trauma of the pandemic and all the stuff that has come along with that. Uh, and so I think it, it really works well. Yeah. And where do you think, where do you think uh, it, Jeremiah can be the most cogently helpful in in that in thinking about preaching uh, trauma? I mean, when you yourself thinking of, think about how is it that 
preachers are are speaking into the trauma of the moment. Where do you see Jeremiah being the most helpful in that kind of proclamation? Well, I, I think uh, uh, you, you begin with with truth telling mm. that Jeremiah has a number of images, imagination, a number of imaginations through which he faithfully describes the world that is at hand. You know, he talks about uh, marital divorce. He talks about uh, uh, sickness. Uh, he talks about a uh, war imagery. He has many, many sets of images, uh, but he gets at the truth. Whereas we are, we are tempted to use all kinds of accommodating euphemisms so that we do not really face in to the depth of the reality in which we are living. So uh, Jeremiah is a truth teller. And uh, what I think the book of Jeremiah shows is that when one is a faithful truth teller in ways that we do not understand, hope wells up. Mm. But hope cannot well up unless the truth is told. Uh, and I think that truth telling uh, is a very hazardous enterprise uh, for preachers today, as it always has been. I think. Yeah, that yeah that takes me back to um, a book that was popular when I was in college, "People of the Lie." Yes. You know, the, uh, the truth telling. So, uh, daring to utter these words is a theme of the book um, uh, from the start to the end, really. Um, the prophets were authorized di directly by Yahweh. Isaiah's lips were burned. Jeremiah, the God touched his mouth. I have put my words in your mouth. Ezekiel got to eat the scroll. <laughs> in what way are we authorized for such um, daring utterance? Well, I suppose every one of us would have to uh, sort that out in terms of our own lived experience. Uh, I take it that, that uh, church ordination is an acknowledgement of that experience. It is, not, it is not the authorizing experience itself, but it's the verification of it. Uh, so uh, I suppose every preacher uh, has to go back in his or her life uh, to, to identify those moments when um, something uh, was demanding or reassuring or empowering. Uh, and we have to fall back on that, I think. My own uh, sense about that was that my dad was a pastor, a mentor to many uh, young pastors. And my sense of authorization came from thinking that that was the smartest, most exciting group of people I ever expected to be with. So when I think about my authorization, I have my, I have my colleagues uh, at hand for me who have expectations from me uh, that I think are linked to the expectations that God may have for me. But I, I suppose everyone has to tell that tale in a very particular way. One of the, uh, one theme of Jeremiah that works so well in teaching, especially when I used to teach Bible survey courses in college, I'd get 50 to 60 minutes on Jeremiah and then I had to move on. I mean, what can you say about <laughs> Jeremiah in an hour to, a, uh, you know, 18 year olds was the prophetic sign act. He was the master, you know, uh, well, uh, von Rod, Gerhard von Rod said there was nothing either sacred or sacred, uh, either sacred or secular that the prophets would not dare defile to get their messages across. Yeah, I right. mean, whether any, any uh, religious form of speech. So Jeremiah, you know, breaks pottery, shapes pottery, uh, walks around with, with just his underwear for, you know, a time. He, uh, he wears a yoke. He buys property. He does. He uh, he had a passion that I don't see very often. It's a lot safer just to stay in uh, in your uh, traditions, uh, 
garb and in the pulpit. Yeah. What can we learn from Jeremiah's creativity? I never, I never thought of it that way before, but I guess I, one would say everywhere he looked, he saw a sign, didn't he? You know, the mm, world, yeah. the world if, you, if you have eyes to see, the world is filled with the signs of the rule of God. Nice. But if you're going to have those eyes, you will think you're looking at a yoke or a pot or underwear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, it's true that Jesus' parables do the same. Uh, Jesus found uh, a narrative embodiment of the kingdom of God everywhere he looked, and most especially in primary relationships. That's, I just want to underscore what you said, because I had never thought of it. Everywhere Jeremiah or Jesus looked, they saw the kingdom of God or a parable for the kingdom of God or an embodiment of the kingdom of God, you right. know, and really in its triune fulfillment, they saw the creation yep. and then they saw the fall and uh, redemption and the spirit's presence, you know, that's really powerful, Walter. Thank you for that. That's right. Yeah. And that's all, it, that is the call of the preacher, uh, it too, is, is, is. right, to... Yeah. Yeah. To go through that week uh, and yeah. with the, with the text and the people in mind and yeah. and to look for to look for that that presence of God and and I often use the image of John the Baptist and say look you know there yes. there yeah. there it is right there. My teacher called that the homiletical eye. Yes. That yeah. You look at that'll preach. That'll preach. That'll preach. Yeah. <laughs> I think Barbara Brown Taylor calls it, uh, and I say this to my students, uh, uh, being uh, detectives of divinity. <laughs> you know, that, that that's your job is to be a detective of divinity. Yeah, right. I, you know, one thing that I, I also was thinking about with this, uh, this book, Walter, and, uh, and then of course, you know, preaching the Old Testament, uh, which is, which is, I think still remains challenging for a lot of preachers. Um, and, but that, that connection that you make very early on in the book of, of its defining trauma of the loss of the familiar Jerusalem, and that that traumatic loss in turn invites Christian reflection on the trauma of the crucifixion of Jesus. And so the way in which way in which we're making, you know, one of the ways to make the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament is to recognize that correlation of right. trauma right. Uh, and, and that the New Testament is speaking into that trauma. But then you say the traumatic, these traumatic losses in turn invite Americans to engage in reflection on the traumatic loss of the old certitude of American chosenness to yes. privilege and dominance. Yes. And I think that's one of the really powerful messages of Jeremiah right now, um, connected in part to the pandemic of racism, the pandemic of, the, of, of COVID, is to uh, that exposure of our privilege. That's right. And, and, and that, that uh, nostalgia for remembering a world that really never existed is what is fueling the resentment and the violence that now is besetting our society in which there is a wish for an old white patriarchal heterosexual world uh, that was wonderful for a few people and yeah. not for very many others. Uh, and I think that, that uh, Psalm 137 about uh, dashing the baby's heads against the wall. Uh, Psalm 137 uh, is uh, an act of nostalgia in which they're ready to kill anybody who has taken away that old world that we treasured. Mm -hmm. So the first task of Jeremiah is to say, whether you treasured that world or not, it is gone. Mm -hmm. It is gone and it is not coming back. It may take some other form, but it is not coming back in that form. And obviously, I think that includes American exceptionalism. That's gone, too. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, that's, that's a very risky articulation in very many contexts. Thank you. Uh, 
the perfect segue. I was just going to bring that up. So the one response to trauma, to having been violated, which Jerusalem was, is to is violence, the cycle yes. of violence. And that's what Psalm 137 uh, wishes for. Yes. Uh, it's interesting that Jeremiah, what is, I can't remember, does he have seven laments? Uh, depends on who's counting, I suppose. I think it usually said six, but I don't know. Six. Um, in none of his laments does he go there. So in none of his laments does he do what Psalm 137 does, is lament and then wish for violence. That's right. But yeah. instead, when in between 597 and 587, so the first deportation and the final destruction, the exiles in Jerusalem write him, and, and you talk about this towards the very end of your book, and say, well, what are we supposed to do now? Do you have a word from the Lord? And he says, I do. And my guess is they were thinking along the lines of Psalm 137, resist the empire, join the terrorists, yep. fight the man, destroy the city of Babylon. You're now our agents there. And he says instead, look around you, plant gardens. The one who said, I'm not having kids because every kid will go into exile in this generation, have kids <laughs> That's right. and seek the shalom of Babylon, for in its shalom, you will find yep. your shalom. That's the opposite of violence. That's right. Or of nostalgia. Yeah. So why? That's a prophetic act of hope. It is. Right? It is. So unpack hope a little bit uh, based on that passage or the, in, or the other from the section of hope. It's really the book of hope in the middle of Jeremiah, isn't it? Well, uh, uh, hope... Uh... <laughs> Hope is the conviction of things not seen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he, he uses um, uh, many images for that. Um, the, at the very beginning of chapter 30, I think he talks about finding grace in the wilderness. And he is using the, the image of wilderness for the exile or the displacement or the deportation. So that is the venue where he expected to find grace. And the rest of that, it seems to me, is, uh, is unpacking that. That's where you get the, the new covenant, which is based on forgiveness. Uh, that is also in, I think it is in 31, where Mother Rachel is grieving for her children and she refuses to be comforted. So, so that even there's a even in chapters 30 and 31, there is a strange mix of grief and hope, suggesting that if you if you hope, you have to, at the same time to be relinquishing what has been lost and recognizing how painful it is to relinquish what has been lost. So I think the I think the preachable point on all of that is that we are in a season of relinquishment and it means turning loose of those things that we have most treasured, which is exactly, which is exactly what Jesus did when he called people to discipleship is to leave behind them their former mm -hmm. life for this new life of risk and companionship. So I think it follows that way. Well, I know uh, we could talk about the book for a very, very long time uh, and and the ways in which uh, this preaching Jeremiah book and preaching the Old Testament is just uh, a well of, I think, hope and encouragement for preachers, which maybe they haven't thought about that about Jeremiah in a while. Uh, but I, I know our listeners also, Walter, want to hear a little bit about you as the preacher. And, uh, and so one question, one question I had is, are, the, are there any times when you, what, those times that you come to the text and you're just at a, at a loss or just not sure where to go or what to do, what gets you unstuck in that moment? Well, I am. Or I are you I always like, You've got I haven't it. Had too much stuckness because I don't. I never <laughs> preach regularly. Yeah. I didn't preach to the same congregation, so you can reuse stuff. Uh, 
but but I I think I uh, it took me a few years to get there, but then I became a lectionary preacher, and uh, uh, when I did experience stuckness, uh, what I did was to look at those texts again. Mm. And if, when I looked at a text, I would start writing my sermon, and often what I started writing, I threw away but it would break me out of uh, the stuckness. And uh, so that never turned out to be a big problem for me, but I, didn't, I did not uh, face the kind of pressures that uh, pastors face in their uh, daily routine, which is very different from the way my life mm. has been ordered, so. Yeah. But I think, you know, one thing that you said, Walter, I, I, I think will really resonate with uh, preachers right now is that that return to the text when you're stuck you know I think that I think sometimes the inclination is to uh, well go find a story or yeah. or you know uh, go uh, get away from the text and and right. I, what I heard you say is like when you're unstuck return to the text <laughs> I think that if we if we pay attention to the text the text is always more interesting than any story we can conjure about the text. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it is useful to ask, why did the community of faith, Israel or the church, why did the community of faith keep this text? Yeah. And if you ask that question, you begin to see how somebody in the community would have thought that this is an important word for us mm. to keep present in our faith. And, and that opens the doors mm. because then, then what the preacher wants to do is to show the congregation why it's important for us to keep this text available in our faith. Mm. Yeah, so what's the hardest sermon uh, you ever preached, whether, you know, whether for a, just a tragic funeral or for a difficult political or church moment and what got you through it? Yeah, I, I would I would guess it would be it would have been a political moment. My tendency uh, is to write a pretty good sermon, but when I get up and uh, look out at the faces in the congregation, I tend to back off and tone it down. Uh, and then I I try to remember what my mandate is. Sometimes I uh, wither in the face of those faces because I know what they're thinking. Uh, and sometimes I think, uh, well, this is something we have to do here now and I'm going to do it and uh, we'll see what comes of it. So, you know, that's uh, the, kind of the, I, I think that's the experience of most preachers uh, because if you preach in the same congregation, you, short, you sort of know after a little while all the different kinds of responses you're going to get and you know exactly from whom you're going to get them. That's really yeah. true. That's really true. Yeah. I was talking to a Methodist pastor recently who said that uh, he had something he had to say, but he had one donor in the congregation that if he knew he said it, he would lose a, an, a line item in his church budget. So he didn't say it. So, yeah, which, which might be a person. Do you indeed, know what I mean? The line item That's might right, be a, a staff, person. Yeah. A staff yeah. person. Right. That's right. Big donor. <laughs> yeah. One of the aspects about this podcast that we're, uh, we're excited about, too, is that we have Bandit, the podcast. And uh, we, Bandit may or may not make an appearance on, on these podcasts, but Bandit is very much present and a very curious cat. He is right and there. There he is. And so Walter Bandit has a couple questions for you. <laughs> and so uh, Bandit is wondering, it doesn't really quite understand why your favorite animal would not be a cat, but uh, if it's not a cat, what is your favorite animal and why? My favorite animal is a cat. Oh, <laughs> because we had uh, uh, T and I had Sammy for about twelve years. Mm. And, uh, Sammy slept with us and and did all the cat things. 
<laughs> later, later on, we tried to have a dog, and uh, Sandy was easy compared to a dog. So I'm a cat person. Bandit he warmed Bandit's heart. Yeah, Bandit would <laughs> like to know what, what is your favorite bird. Oh, my favorite bird is a cardinal. I knew it would be. Just like my baseball team. <laughs> <laughs> a bandit is also wondering, Walter, if, did you ever play a musical instrument? I, like every kid in my generation, I took piano lessons until I didn't. <laughs> After that, I only played the radio. <laughs> bandit would like to know what's the weirdest place you've ever taken a nap? Uh, on a park bench in Zurich by the streetcar track. And uh, my wife had gone shopping and I fell asleep. And when the streetcar came, some good Zurich woman woke me up and I had to tell her I wasn't going, getting on the Strassenbahn. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I take and, naps everywhere. I'm yeah. a good nap taker. And Bandit is also wondering, uh, besides the the besides Jeremiah and the books of the Old Testament, uh, do you have a favorite book, or is a book that was really uh, meaningful to you? You mean in the Bible? No, of any book, any oh. book. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath mm. was an early and shaping book for me mm. about. Uh, Poverty and displacement. Last mm. question from Bandit. Bandit would like to know if the serpent in Genesis 3 gets too much credit for the fall. <laughs> well, I suppose Bandit is a Lutheran and he believes in the fall more fervently than I do. Uh, but no, I, yeah, I do think that there's too much credit for that. It could have been a cat or a dog as well as a serpent. Well, Bandit would... Bandit thinks there should have been a cat getting credit for the fall. <laughs> That's right. Well, Walter, we are so thrilled that you could join us for this first episode of Working Preacher Books podcast. And we want to thank, thank everybody out there for listening to this episode. Stay up to date on our conversation at workingpreacher.org. You can also follow us on Twitter or Facebook and find the latest in our Working Preacher book series at workingpreacher.org backslash books. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm so glad to get to be with you. And I'm uh, grateful to, to Rolf for uh, having seen these two preaching books through. So thank you. Thanks, Walter. Hello, Narrative Lectionary Preachers, along with Working Preacher Books listeners. Um, this is to announce a summer series uh, on Jeremiah for the summer of 2021, starting May 30th. We got an email from a uh, Narrative Lectionary Preacher saying, hey, I would like a series this summer on preaching one of the prophetic books. And it just so happens we've just published Preaching Jeremiah in our Working Preacher books. And so we have a series coming up on Jeremiah. You'll start with the call of Jeremiah and the temple sermon, then the potter and the clay, one of the great sign acts of Jeremiah, the scroll burned and rewritten, the letter to the exiles, Jeremiah buys a piece of property when Jerusalem is under siege, and finally the promise of Messiah and new covenant. Look for more on this on the website, and we hope you'll join us to preach Jeremiah.